For some time, people have been predicting the end of print. No more books, no more newspapers. There was even a television program predicting just that. You remember Goodbye Gutenberg. But I wonder if I'm really going to be reading my local paper off a TV screen. Are computers really going to become the new media? Yes. Yes, they are, Chris. Welcome to the Computer Program episode number five. This one is called The New Media, and it was published or aired on the 8th of February, 1982. What a year, what, a, what an era to be alive in the world of computing, especially in the UK. So, as normal, I approach this program having only seen this. Last time I saw this, I would have been, what, six, probably? Way back in infant school. Occasionally, it triggers the odd memory. Lead poisoning! <laughs> Wasn't that like a massive thing in the 80s? Like Warhammer figures. Don't touch them, because you get lead poisoning. Pencils, lead poisoning, even though it wasn't lead by then. The cities to these hills in search of gold. Life was rough, tough, and dangerous. Mac is always out and about, isn't he? He's always off on his little fantasy runs, dressing up. He loves it. He's in the Isle of Wight, apparently. I didn't know there was a wild west town of the Isle of Wight. Once a month, if you were lucky, the mail would arrive by mule train. A journey of 53 days. By 1858, the stagecoach had penetrated deep into the west. And it cut the time for the 2,700 miles... Stealthy stagecoach. ...to St. Louis to a mere 23 days. Go on, Matt. Oh, he's, he's the driver. On the Pony Express. ...as hell on wheels. But for special messages, there was a faster way. The news of Abraham Lincoln's election in 1860 was sent by Pony Express, a distance of 2,000 miles in a mere six and a half days. But the era of the Pony Express... Not bad. ...the last 18 months, before it too was replaced by a device that revolutionised communications. And the principles of that device have hardly changed over the last 150 years. I like the slower pace of these programmes. Back in the 80s. The connection to Salt Lake City is late. Can you telegraph ahead and find out what's gone wrong? Is that, is that an American accent he's putting on? That is amazing, Mac. A man of few words. But he does know the code that allow me to send a message at the speed of light to anywhere connected to the end of that wire. It's a fairly simple code, no more than a series of ons and offs. And it doesn't really matter what it is, as long as the guy at the other end understands it, and he can send a message back in the same code. Morse code. These early pioneers were massively impressive, weren't they? Da, did, did, da, did, in many ways, it's more impressive than the technology that followed. Stage attack by Indians. Cutting edge of technology. Tuesday week. Tuesday? Da, 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 da. Indians? I wonder if I got that right. Da, 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 da. I'm sure it's fine, Mac. Look in the sent Morse code folder. Today, Mac <laughs> would simply have made a phone call. But there are still many kinds of message which we'd obviously rather send in the form of the written word. Letters can take a long time, although not quite as long as in the American West. And telegrams depend on knowing exactly where the other person is going to be and sending it there. What we often need is the instant letter, which can reach somebody no matter where they are. Are we talking what electronics? Very early days of email. Or Pre-email, yes, for Prestel systems. Telephone line to the Prestel computer. And as soon as we dial it up and get the Prestel display on our screen, it's nice and friendly, welcome to Prestel, and immediately, new messages for you, key star 930, and that funny... Not so Prestel awesome. was, uh, wasn't it a Royal Mail Nine venture? Oh, hash. And what do we get? Or in association with the Royal Mail. Program, that's us. Message at Buffalo Creek. Stage attack by Indians. We'll get there when I can. Look at those cutlers. Signed Mac. So let's key one to store it away. And now we can send a message to Mac. So we just have to dial up. If we're regular users, we know how to do it. Dial up star nine. I believe the BBC Micro was compatible with this. Or hash. 
using its one of its screen modes blank on the screen which we can then fill in and obviously Okay. With a modem, etc. The recipient's account number. Well, we'll send it to Mac at the BBC's own personal Prestel number. So let's say 01999199902 and a hash. And it's to Mac. It recognizes his number. So it'll get onto a Prestel machine wherever he is. And we send the message. What should we say to Mac? Good. Man, these were exciting days. Imagine that. Never before could you send a message instantly in this format. And then boom, the world is wide open. The most kind message to the sender, key one to send, two to cancel. So we key one. Now, that's only the tip of the iceberg. Clear, hash, three. But like all these things, it had to get a lot easier to use before it entered the mainstream of society. We'll connect you with British Telecom. Does that say Dick on his screen? The North Hertfordshire District oh, Council's computer. I can't even make it out. Time is calculating the rates, and the council payroll, the styling. Computer will also let you book a squash court or tell you what's happening at your local leisure centre, and you simply have to type in your user. ICL International Computers Limited. This is two hundred. Hash. My dad worked there. Comes quick as a flash. At one point. From the North Hertfordshire District Council. Activities and facilities, bookings, forthcomings, attractions, locations, membership. Wow, well, look at this. One of those numbers to get the facility. And this felt, this was... Computers have now gone beyond... Ahead of its time, really, wasn't it? People were like, oh, this is the future. You can book online, you can shop online. From people at all. Here's Jill Mel Didn't really happen until the internet. Train timetables are often regarded as a bit of a joke. Some people believing their mail works are fiction. But there's nothing fictitious about the master timetable system installed by British Rail at Waterloo. Nor is there any question of the ability of this computerised system to cope with the arrival or departure of a train every 30 seconds during peak hours and 180,000 passengers. These lovely 80s people. They're not much different from people today. Every day the time is loaded into this computer as a reference, so that what actually happens and whether people really arrived on time can be analysed and compared with what should have happened. Suits never really age, do they? They're kind of timeless. The comparison is made by the computers themselves without any human intervention. What happens is this. Each train has a schedule of oh. time and stopping pattern. Doors just swing open. Before we had automatic doors. Progress is automatically monitored and passed to this computer. When the train arrives at its destination, its record is examined and passed to. 80s footage always looks so so dreary and dull. The train reporting system operates Bleak. on an exception basis. That is, if the trains are. I love it. The information is ignored by the computer. But if there's a deviation of more than a minute either way, the record of its performance is printed out for examination by the divisional computer. We've got a disc error there. If you like, it's a sort of dialogue between the computers. How's the 11.15? It's a bit late at the other end. Get your eye on it, will you? Time's just supposed to get in. 11.40. Hmm. Seems There's to be some cover in Clapham Junction. Their voice is OK. Uh, Obviously, Mac, when people talk to each other and communicate with each other, they use words and languages. And I guess that when computers are talking to each other or within themselves, they're not really do using words and languages as we understand them. No, they're not. They're communicating with electrical patterns, if you like. And this is a small mainframe computer, which will be sending... A small mainframe. <laughs> I mean, it is. It was by... Standards then. Sending information back, it'll be sending it to this magnetic tape. That'll be sending it back. And of course, it'll be receiving messages from this control console or a terminal and again sending messages. I remember going to my dad's workplace in the 80s and in, in the mainframe room was just packed with technology. Here, this terminal is connected with that computer. Yes. Is there any limit to the distance that can be away? No, no limit at all, to, providing you use the telephone network. Right. And I think we can see this very clearly. In oh, here's the BBC micro. 
if you remember, the information is stored in eight ons and offs, or a byte. Right. And the keyboard here communicates with the actual computer itself yeah. through this band of wire. Right. But effectively, it's sent in parallel, eight at a time, into the computer. Now, you can't do that over a telephone line. If that was in New York, you'd have to send them one after another. But you can think of them rather like soldiers marching down those telephone lines. Well, this is amazing animation. It doesn't require much imagination to see what the possibilities of this method of communication could be. This is British Aerospace's new Airbus, the 146. Its wiring systems have been developed, checked or modified throughout the design and construction stages by programmers working from their own homes. That man is flying like a bloody maniac. National, a computer systems company who supplies software to industry. Is everything so so bleak it's just it's just amazing an employee is supplied with a terminal connected via the telephone to the computer in Hatfield colors slightly washed out it just adds to the effect established and the programmer has logged on by giving her password programs can be run automatically what's more new ones can be written mistakes from the previous day's work corrected and the results stored on disk on disc. Look at the size of that thing. I've got some of these down at the uh, Cambridge uh, Computer Museum. Ah. Weren't they... didn't... weren't they used like that because there was some sort of copyright about connecting things directly to the line? So they circumvented it of the work that appealed to Leslie Smith by having these sockets to plug the receiver into. It was either copyright or it was a licensing issue. to an office or office hours. And obviously that's easier as well than hooking it up to a light. You can just get your telephone off the wall and slap it in this these rubber cups and off you go. When her programs are on the disc, they can be printed out on the line printer ready for checking by the plane's designers before becoming part of the wiring specifications and sent out onto the factory floor. This is an interesting thing. I was out for a run today and I came across a load of that old um, f fed paper just lying on the road. seemed entirely out of place. It gave me a warm feeling of dot matrix memories. Oh, we're on a plane. Or oh, a ship from aliens could be the Nostromo. Flying into the 80s with style. Look at those colours are even 80s. Oh, this hello. Programming was going backwards and forwards down an ordinary telephone line. Now that's quite a thought because it opens up all sorts of possibilities. You may not think the average householder would have much need to access a database, but here's a database that everyone wants to access from time to time. It's a telephone directory. Now in France, the post office quite a few telephone directories for the whole country onto a computer and have a terminal in every home. Those crazy French bastards. The telephone directories. It'll be supplied. Free. Now the first stage is already in use in parts of France and we are at this moment connected to it. Now we've dialed through and we've got a summary. That is, look at that thing, that is... It has even got an English language version. A compact little, it looks like it's straight out of an 80s uh, film, doesn't it? It looks like it's been taken... Let's go for the name first and see. From that film with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Any film of Arnold Schwarzenegger in the 80s. We just have to press a number. Now, here we are, a little form to fill in. Name. We're going to look up the Monsieur Martin as an example. There we are. Martin is typed in. Press next. But most see. definitely total press recall. We're going to get the first name, but only the name. But it wants to <laughs> took me a while to remember that for some reason. To put in the name of a place. So let's put in Ren. Suppose I don't know how to spell Ren. I shall just put R-E-N and send and it even corrects my spelling r-e-double-n-e-s is how it should be spelt now there is at least 30 the french were ahead of a game the french directory says we don't want all 30 of them let's see if we can narrow it down a little bit so let's put in an initial his first name begins with s so s and send and up should come the directory and there we are there are three breaking data protection act 
No, this is a public phone book, isn't it? In Germany, if you want to do your shopping or even pay all your bills instantly from home, Bildschirm text gives you that. What? Bildschirm? If you know the telephone number, you can even reach it from here with an ordinary Prestel adapter, which is what we've done. Now, we've gone through the Bildschirm text network at this very moment, and now we're directly connected to the computer of a large German bank. <laughs> this is what an instant electronic bank's... What are you going to do? Bit of fraud? Yeah, Bill. We just go to the appropriate page. Well, look at this. How exciting. What's that? Two million pounds? Deutschmarks? And there it is. We can fill in the details of who we want to send the money to, his bank code number, the postal code of the bank, and so on and so on. You can even fill in a little box here which says what the money is for. Amazing. And here, of course, is the amount. Pioneering illegal money exchanges since 1982. In a few months' time, a similar facility will be available from one of the big four British banks on Prestel. Well, for those of us who work in offices, and that, believe it or not, is about 40% of the working population, these new electronic systems... I wonder what percentage that is now. Very, very big changes. 80? Well, let's take a look at a typical office of today. And what are the first things you see, apart from the man working in it? It's the fire... Oh, that's off micro men, that part. Then, Mac? Well, most of them are going to go, Chris, along with the invoices and bills. Those are all going to be sent through by the computer. What about our old office friend, the faithful typewriter? Are we going to say goodbye to that as well? <laughs> well, they're allowed to be replaced today by word processing equipment, and that's going to be enhanced. I love the 80s offices look, baby. They look papers everywhere. It's just something about that. His job will really be enhanced as she's able to help her boss in understanding the sort of speed at which his business is changing. Does that mean you're going to do away with paper altogether? Oh, this whole scene is in Micro Men, isn't it? It's quite a big scene. No, they're not, because people really do still like to read things on paper and not on screens. But there is one remorseless fact that's happening. The cost of telecommunications are going down by 15% of the year, and the cost of delivering paper is going up by a similar amount. So shipping vast amounts of data around on paper is just going to disappear. Now, as you said, there is going to be paper. There's going to be an amount of paper but an awful lot less much, of much it. less of it. That's All right, well, come right. with me a second, Mac. I want to show you something. This is a sort of uh, a computer program speculative view, possibly, of the office <laughs> of the future. Um, we've got our... Oh, now we are talking. We've got our uh, view data terminal here, and we've got, as you described it, the word processor with its... Talking about the uh, museum in Cambridge, they've got a 70s office setup, which is a bit like this. It's there'll still be a filing cabinet, so some of the paper that will certainly terribly nice to be in. printing out paper because we know that people do like to see it, and it'll certainly be there. There will be screens, certainly, colour, beautiful graphics. They've gone out of their way to make sure there's no paper at all in this office, haven't they? Except for the printer. The one thing I'm not so sure about is whether we'll see. Hopefully, people will find a replacement for that, which is the keyboard, and that's the real thing that needs the breakthrough. Inputting data with a keyboard is difficult, it's prone to errors, and it takes... It hasn't really changed, I'm afraid, Mac. But whatever you say about keyboards as they are now, there's still always going to be a need for the manipulation of text. And is that the sort of job we can do on our microcomputer? Yes, it is. A lot of people think of um, computers as handling... It's interesting that there is three screens in that office, like three different terminals. Or manipulating data, characters, words and letters and so on. And we can show you some of the instructions on here. You recognise that. I'm beginning to recognise... This bit's from Micro Men as well. Program, yes, a computer program. Well, the first one is probably new to you. It's CLS, which is a very nice way of saying clear screen. And then it cuts over two Acorn engineers coming in and entering their own code. Your standard basic... That's right, yes. ...computer jargon. Well, I think I recognise the shape of the next one anyway. Print quotes, what is your word? That means that when you run the program, the first thing it'll do is print on the screen the words, what is your word, question mark. Right, OK. Yes. And input word string is telling the computer to expect a word, a string of letters making up a right. word. Which in future you'll be able to refer to as word string and it knows where to find that word. It's a variable. What we're going to do is to write a little instruction which tells you how many characters there are in the word that you've put in. Uh -huh. So we can do that with the next instruction. All right. Let's Let's print. Next. Print. Anyone know the famous instruction? Yes. In quotations. Yes. The length of your word is... Oops. No. We're getting to some advanced operations now. Yes. Now, and close, in, close the quotes. Right. Um, len, len word. Now, len is one of these abbreviations for length of word. And length will simply give us the length of, or the number of characters in your Beautiful. Basic is so 
something beautiful abbreviation len and in len, its structure the name that we've given it which is word string so it's len so. space word string and that simply counts the number of letters in the word in the word yes so, so it's very simple if you hit return then run it oh yes. right well supercalifragilisticexpialidocious that's a word Right, carries your turn Arthur. or return. Oh, the lengthy word is six, which is the number of characters in Arthur. One, two, three, four, That's five, six. Clever. Well, of course, you can't show a whole program. We're showing little bits of instructions. That was a single instruction, if you like, which did that. But I have got a little program here and a floppy. This is the yeah, little floppy famous disk. Floppy. Oh, Max has been at work. He's created something yeah. amazing. Close it up. Yeah. And then we type load quotation marks text. I like how they, they introduce you in little snippets to these basic programs every week. They go out and about, they show you some trains, some 80s footage, and then they snuckle down on the BBC Micro. Now, what we're going to show you, if you run it, mm. type run. In the second series. You'll we'll see some text coming up. Or, um, make the most of your micro, which came after yeah, this. Yeah. It's all higgledy-piggledy. Went proper into basic. Yeah. They're not lying. Oh, it's as if, as if you typed it on a typewriter, yes. and the left-hand margin is straight, and the right-hand margin is always all crooked and indented. Yes, well, it's okay. one of the jobs a sort of word processor would do, which would have to count these letters, and then work out how to shorten them to make all these correct. This um, is actually the sort of job that a, an expert compositor in a, in a printing works would spend hours putting little slivers of metal in between the yes, metal type right. blocks to get it straight. Right. right. <laughs> Max, like... Yes, Chris. And are we simply hit a key? Bing. There's it done. Well, it's... Well, Chris is clearly excited. He's saying that the computer provides an immensely powerful means for handling communications, but so much so that, as I said at the very beginning of the programme, some people have problems in our way of life. For instance, people, it's been said, will no longer go to offices to work. They'll work from... Have a VHS jump there. And banking can be done from the comfort of your own terminal, right next to your own armchair. There'll be no more letter post, no more newspapers, no more libraries. Oh, that hasn't come yet, I'm afraid. Stick of these predictions. Rex Malik. People do like paper. Oh, we're up to see Malik. The bleak, even bleaker 80s man. What you've just seen tempts me to say, welcome to the electronic global village. Indeed, I'm also tempted to say, welcome to the electronic global office. But first, a word of warning. <laughs> Malik loves a warning. Different. But it's not all different. Computers are additional. They don't supplant what came before. They extend rather than constrict. I doubt an end to books and paper. I do see their role changing. I doubt the paperless office. Uh, I observe that uh, paper is what people prefer to read. Show me an office that uh, doesn't... He's always bang on the money, isn't he? Probably also show me an office that doesn't even really need people. Uh, if you'll excuse the pun, you could foresee there the people less office. I doubt that. I think that's an illusion. The truth is that we need the office or something similar. We need somewhere to fight, to argue. To, to fight? What kind of work are these people doing in the office? What offices are for. All that electronics do is extend the scope of the action. So you have problems with the office next door? Well, just wait. I can see you having similar problems in the 80s, but with offices in Tokyo, San Francisco, London, Melbourne. As I say, welcome to the electronic... I notice he's got a typewriter. No computer on his desk. I think he dislikes technology. Anyway, that is the end of the computer program, episode number five, The New Media. Looking at communications and the media been quite a big gap since the last one of these. It's nice to, sp to space them out because there's only 10 episodes of the computer program. Anyway, that's all for now. I will catch you on the next one. Thank you for watching and have a great evening as always. Goodbye.